Well, good morning. I'm Becky, and whether you are with us in person or with us online, we're so glad that you're here today, and I want to start our time together with a question. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. I can't believe I'm doing this right now. You guys, this is so shameful. That's just, it will be over soon. What do you call a guy pretending to be a mailman? An imposter. Okay, only one more, I promise. What do you call a cat who steals someone's identity? An imposter. <laughs> you can blame Pastor Sean. He started this. I don't really like dad jokes. But I do want to get you thinking about imposters today because we're going to be talking about a dangerous and very deceptive mentality that is after your identity. It's a mentality that wants you to forget who you are and where you came from. See, all the way back in the very first pages of the Bible, God put the very first people in a perfect paradise garden home that they would get to live in on one condition, that they followed God's one command. And they didn't. And they were banished from the garden into a world now shattered and broken. And the whole Bible is a story of how the cost of sin is exile. Somebody say exile. Exile. So here we are. Exile is the human condition. And I know you can relate to this. You might have a great home that you get to live in, but it's situated in a world that's scarred with pain and broken relationships and death and tragedy caused by other people, tragedy done by us. And we all keep repeating this pattern of going our own way instead of God's and finding ourselves in an exile of our own making. But the big picture story of the Bible is also a story of restoration. Somebody say restoration. That's right, restoration of the hope, the hope that Jesus is offering to us. If we'll choose to follow him, if we'll repent of our self-centeredness that causes us to create false homes or false identities based on status or power or on our ideas of security or self-sufficiency. Jesus went to the cross to make a way home for us. And he prayed for us before he went. And he said this to the Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. You know how no matter what kind of place you lay your head at night, there's still sometimes that empty feeling inside of you, tugging at you, saying, there's got to be more. It's not supposed to be this way. It's because this world, the way it is right now, isn't the way it was supposed to be. It's not our forever home. We're foreigners here, but we were made by God for his kingdom. And while we're here, we wait and we long for our true home. And God has given us a mission while we're here to show people Jesus, the only way home. And we were made to be in the world, to change the world for the better, but to do it without letting the patterns of the world, of the enemy, change us. This requires us to build relationships, not withdraw. It requires us to have conversations with people who think differently than we do. It requires us to care about people in this broken world so that we can show them the way home. So we established last week that Christians are called to have loving, respectful conversations while maintaining strong biblical convictions. We're not called to be right we're called to be effective, to change the world the way Jesus did by living in this dynamic tension between grace and truth. And we're looking at the life of Daniel in this series because Daniel was a world changer who operated in grace and truth. And he made a powerful impact on the people around him in the midst of a culture that was working overtime to undermine and attack everything he stood for. 
and identity is key here. Daniel may have been in exile, surrounded by all sorts of pressures and influences that could have easily caused him to change. But he was able to stand firm because he knew who he was and he knew who he was living for. And the same is true for us as people of God living in the world with an enemy who's waging war against our identity. In order to stand firm, we have to know who we are and we have to know whose we are. So let me give you a quick overview on the book of Daniel for some background if you missed last week. God's people, the Israelites, were living in this cycle that's been repeating itself since Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. They wanted to live like everyone around them instead of following God's way. And since God doesn't force anyone to follow him, he gave his people their way. The problem was their way resulted in pain and what they thought would bring them freedom actually brought them bondage. So the city of Jerusalem was attacked and burned. The temple was destroyed and the people were taken into captive in a city called Babylon, far from home as exiles. Somebody say exiles. And everything about Babylon was a direct contrast to what God wanted for his people. And this is where we find Daniel. He's an Israelite exile living as a servant to Babylon's king. And it's important to remember that Babylon is a real place on the map. It's where we find present day Iraq, but Babylon is also a prevalent mentality that's perpetuated throughout human history. And it's against everything that God stands for. It's the polar opposite of love and refuge and dignity and peace. And Babylon is a symbol of exile, of separation from God that results from sin and all the tragedy and pain that comes along with it. The Babylon mentality shows up all through the Bible, but it's not just a thing of the past. Its influence is all around us. So this message series and this book of the Bible that we're studying, it's not just a story that happened once upon a time in the city of Babylon. This is a story of how the spirit of the Babylon mentality is crouching at our doors right now, waiting to steal our identities as sons and daughters of God. So today I wanna get in to how we can recognize the Babylon mentality and how we can resist it. And who better represents the mentality of Babylon than the king of Babylon himself? So to define the Babylon mentality, we're going to put Daniel's life on pause until next week. And today we're going to talk about Babylon's king, Nebuchadnezzar. If you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, go ahead and turn with me to Daniel chapter 4. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. Wait, this is the king of Babylon saying this after all we just talked about? Well, remember how I told you that Daniel stood firm in his true identity and he made a huge impact on the people around him in Babylon? Well, there's a little bit of foreshadowing going on here. And the reason that Nebuchadnezzar says this will make sense in a few minutes. But for now, just notice that the king of Babylon has a pretty amazing God story to share. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. Nebuchadnezzar's life, it had been going pretty well. He was living a life of ease, in luxury, and he was thriving. That's one of the Babylon mentality's first lies right there, that if you live the Babylon way, you'll live in comfort, you'll live in prosperity, everything will go well for you. But be careful, because it won't last. The king's carefree existence is about to be shattered with a troubling dream. In verse five, he goes on, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. 
I saw visions that terrified me as I laid in bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so that they could tell me what my dream meant. And when all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they couldn't tell me what it meant. And at last, Daniel came in before me and I told him the dream. His name was Belshazzar, after my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Let's pause here. Nebuchadnezzar is asking Belshazzar to interpret his dream. Last week, Sean taught us about the culture of compromise and how it wants to rename you. We saw this happen to Daniel when Babylon calls him by a different name than his own. So this guy, Belshazzar, is our friend whose real name is Daniel. Each one of us has a name, right? It's an identifier. It's what we're called. Shakespeare tried to convince us in Roman, Romeo and Juliet that a name isn't all that important. Juliet cries, what's, uh, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet, right? And maybe Shakespeare's on to something, and maybe you're not so sure that names are that big a deal either. After all, your identity runs deeper than a string of letters that make a particular sound or look a certain way on paper, But what about on the playground when the kids used your name as a way of teasing you? Did your name matter then? And what if someone steals your information online and then racks up a whole bunch of debt in your name? You know, during the Holocaust, the Nazis employed a particular tactic on every prisoner, every man, woman, and child in order to dehumanize them from the moment that they brought them through their doors. They replaced each person's name with a number and that number was cruelly tattooed on their skin. Bella Miller, a Holocaust survivor, describes it this way. You were not anymore a human being. You were a number. And believe me, that number will never leave my mind. A24977, that's what I was. Names matter. And the truth is, names matter. They carry a great deal of significance to the God who knew our names before we were ever born. Psalm 139 tells us that God knew us before he formed us in our mother's womb. And in Isaiah 43, 1, God says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. It is our names that God records in his book of life. When we give our lives to Jesus, Revelation 3, 5 tells us. And throughout scripture, we see God give people new names when they put their faith in him or when they believe that his promises are true. From Abraham to Jacob to Peter to Paul, just to name a few. And Isaiah 40 even tells us that God names all of the stars in the sky. So names matter. And there's something about your name that is deeply connected to your identity. Well, the Babylon mentality doesn't only want to rename you like Sean taught us last week. It will wear down your identity until you unknowingly but voluntarily take on a different name than your own. And not just any name. Listen to what God says about Babylon in Isaiah 47. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there's no one besides me. You felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge have led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. Babylon's motto is I am, and there's no one besides me. Yikes. Hold that thought. Let's go back to Exodus. When God meets Moses in the burning bush and calls him to lead his people out of a different exile when they were slaves in Egypt, Moses asks God what his name is. And here's what happens. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is my name forever the name you shall call me from generation to generation. I am is not just a phrase. It's a name. It's who God is. He is, and there is no other. God's very name is I am, but Babylon's motto is I am, and there's no one besides me. 
The physical city of Babylon finds its very roots in Genesis 11, 4, when the people said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. The Babylon mentality wants you to do everything you can to lift up your own name rather than God's name. I am, and there's no one besides me. Can I nerd out with you guys for a minute? Y'all know this is my favorite thing. Okay, I want you to look at the 10 commandments with me real quick in Exodus chapter 20. I made you a quick summarized version of it that just gives you kind of the main points without all the all the extra details in there. But 10 commandments, you know, we've got, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Don't murder, don't steal, don't, don't lie. Okay, right? As a little girl though, Reading these in order from one to 10, it always seemed to me that one of them really stood out, like it was out of place. And it's this one. In Exodus 20, verse seven, it says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And I don't know about you, but I was taught that this means never to throw around God's name callously or to use it in our expressions. But here's the thing, context matters. And this command is sandwiched right in between commands about worshiping God above all, worshiping him alone, and remembering that he's God and laying down control by intentionally keeping the Sabbath. And not only that, but this particular command comes with a pretty intense qualifier. Exodus 20 verse 7 says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain for The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Wait, what? Is it an unforgivable offense to say God's name in a callous way? Somehow murder and adultery and stealing, those ones are forgivable. But saying OMG is not. Okay, well, here's where we get to get super nerdy. Okay. The word that we see in our English Bibles is take, or sometimes translated as misuse. But if we look at the original Hebrew word for the word that we see translated into English as take here, it sheds a lot of light on the heart behind the command. So the word is transliterated nasa, and it literally means to lift up, bear up, carry, take or accept. And for those of you who are note takers, I didn't have enough space to put this in your paper notes or in your online notes today. So you can flip your paper right over and go ahead and write about this if you want to. So the word Nasa, like I said, it's translated literally as to lift up, bear up, carry, take, or accept. And this verb shows up 653 times in the Bible. And in the other passages of scripture, we see that same word being used to describe things such as carrying the Ark of the Covenant, receiving God's words, a father carrying his child, bearing the weight of our sin and guilt, God taking away sin, taking a wife and marrying her, wearing a particular identifying clothing or lifting up a prayer. So what if we insert some of those other translations for the word nasa into Exodus 20, verse 7, to try to understand it better, bearing in mind that in vain means falsely, in emptiness, or with deceit. This is what we'd get. Do not carry the name of the Lord in vain. Do not bear the weight of the name of the Lord in vain. Do not wear the name of the Lord in vain. Do not take as in marriage, the name of the Lord in vain. Do not pray to the name of the Lord in vain. And why not? Because the rest of the verse says, the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Whoa. Romans 10, 13 tells us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our faith in Jesus, in who he is, and in what his name stands for is how God saves us from our sin. And this is where we find the forgiveness that leads to eternal life. And when we have faith in him, we call ourselves Christians. 
we take his name. But what happens if we're just saying words? If we say we believe in Jesus, if we call ourselves Christians, but nothing changes in our lives, then we keep on insisting on our own ways. Well, we're taking his name in vain. And we go on like the Israelites in Babylon living in exile from God. And God can't hold us guiltless. He can't save us from our sin and bring us back to himself because salvation happens when we truly call on the name of Jesus, when we take his name. Can I just give you a super practical example of this? Taking the name describes how when I married Sean, I took his last name as my own. I became Becky Bennett. But if I was to commit adultery and break our marriage covenant, then I would have taken his name in vain. Does that make sense? So God wants our hearts. He wants our whole lives, not just lip service. But what's Babylon's mentality? It's the opposite. I am and there's no other. And that mentality will rob you of life. So let me put this in simpler words and tell you how we end up here. The renaming, redefining spirit of the Babylon mentality tries to get you to do two things. Tries to get you to elevate self and lower God. Babylon wants you to elevate self and lower God. And we can see if we're elevating ourselves by a few things. Self-adoring is a form of elevating self. This is when we think I am worthy. Self-adoring can happen in a way that looks obviously prideful. Look at me, I'm awesome. But it can also happen in a hidden pride in the form of insecurity. Notice me love me, admire me, approve of me, accept me. Self-adoring happens when we say my way is the better way. My opinion is the right one. Elevating self can also happen through self-sufficiency when we say I am enough. I was born this way. This is just who I am. I don't need to change. Maybe we say I'm the provider. I'm the one who makes sure my needs get met. I'm the one who keeps all the plates in my world spinning. I'm in control. You find yourself getting offended when somebody has a different idea than you? This is the lie of self-sufficiency right there that's saying, I should be able to do this without you. We also elevate self through self-indulging, saying, I am deserving. I deserve to have what I want, to do what I want to do. No shame. Don't judge. It's my choice. The Babylon mentality wants you to elevate self. It also wants you to lower God. Maybe you think, God doesn't love me. This is what the Babylon mentality does. It tries to make God into our own image, into something that we understand and approve of. And we begin to put qualifiers on God, like a loving God wouldn't let this happen, or a loving God wouldn't tell people who they can love, or if God loved me, then you fill in the blank. We lower God when we think God isn't for me. Here's another qualifier. If God was for me, these things would be going well for me. If God was on my side, then this wouldn't be happening. Let me tell you the demonic spirit behind the Babylon mentality capitalizes on hurt and pain and suffering and loss in our lives. And it tries to convince us that God is the real bad guy, that he's too far off, that he's too silent, that is taking too long. We lower God when we think God wants too much from me. God doesn't understand. God made this too hard. Give 10% of my income to the church. Surely God doesn't understand how strapped I am already. Cerebate church? Are you kidding? Sunday is my one day off. God is asking too much. The Babylon mentality elevates our view of self and it lowers our view of God. And this is the mentality that broke the world and sent us all into exile. Sin is what happens when I choose my way. Salvation is what happens when I choose God's way. So back in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar is about to find this out in a very real way. In Daniel 4 verse 9, 
I said to him, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now, tell me what my dream means. So he goes on, he describes his dream to Daniel, this dream about a flourishing tree that gets cut down and the dream really shakes him up. This isn't the first time that God has tried to get Nebuchadnezzar's attention in a big way through a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar knows that this dream is significant too. He goes on, Belshazzar, this was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so, but you, you can tell me, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Do you see the lip service going on here? How he's taking the name? Nebuchadnezzar is acknowledging God. He's seen him do great things, and he's not gonna deny his existence. But he also knows that Daniel has a solid connection with this God. So he believes that it's possible for someone to trust him. But he's still seeing God as one God among many gods, more like a superstition or a good luck charm rather than one to fear and revere. So now God gives Daniel understanding and he explains the dream. In Daniel 4, 19 Belshazzar replied, I wish the the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my Lord, and not to you. The tree that you saw was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. And that tree, your majesty, is you. For you've grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to the heavens and your rule to the ends of the earth. And then you saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven saying, cut down that tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and the roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him live with the animals of the field for seven periods of time. And just a really fun thing for you to take into your Bible study. The Hebrew authors loved using numbers in symbolic ways. And so whenever you see the number seven in your Bible, it's a number that represents perfection or completeness. So seven periods of time could mean seven seasons or seven years. In this case, historically, it did mean seven years, but ultimately it represents the complete amount of time that this process will take. In verse 24, Daniel goes on. This is what the dream means. Your majesty and what the most high has declared will happen to my Lord, the King. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. And this means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you've learned that heaven rules. Don't miss that although there's a hefty consequence being announced for Nebuchadnezzar choosing to go his own sinful way, God isn't cutting him off altogether. God says that he's going to leave a stump with roots still in the ground. God is offering mercy even to this king who had been famous for his violent ways, for cruelty and complete selfishness. King Nebuchadnezzar Daniel says, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what's right. Break free from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. And perhaps then you'll continue to prosper. Daniel tells the king to repent. Turn from your ways. Do things God's way. You aren't stuck. You don't have to keep living like this. If anyone understands the need to repent, it's Daniel. His entire people is living in exile because God offered them the choice between life and death, between blessing and curse, between my way and God's way, and they chose wrong. Our God is so merciful. He's ready to forgive us if we'll turn around. But does Nebuchadnezzar do it? No, because he still wanted to hang on to his own way, just like Israel, just like us. And just like Israel, Nebuchadnezzar ends up in an exile of his own making. 
verse 28. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. Twelve months later, do you see this? The lapse of an entire year between the dream and its fulfillment is a testimony to God's patience and his compassion. God gave Nebuchadnezzar that much time to repent and change his behavior toward both God and toward Israel. But Nebuchadnezzar doesn't take the opportunity to repent. His pride, that Babylon mentality of I am and there is no other, is his downfall. Verse 30 goes on. As he looked out across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. And while these words were still in the king's mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. And sure enough, he gets driven out. He goes insane. He eats grass. He loses his mind, okay? And in that very same hour, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had was fulfilled. Make no mistake, God loves us enough to meet us where we're at. But he loves us too much to let us stay there. He's a good father, and he won't let our stubbornness keep on working for us for very long. Pride comes before a fall. Here's Nebuchadnezzar's fall. But look at what happens next in verse 34. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned and I praised and worshiped the most high and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? And when my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and glory and my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. The Babylon mentality had caused Nebuchadnezzar to lose himself completely. But when he turns to God, he breaks free from the Babylon mentality. Have you ever felt like you've lost yourself completely? Nebuchadnezzar's mind gets restored and his ability to make sense of the world around him is restored. His identity is restored. What God designed him to be was restored. He says in verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true and he is able to humble the proud. Nebuchadnezzar finally got it. He repented. He didn't just say sorry, because just like we talked about with taking God's name in vain, repentance can't just be words. It's not just saying sorry and then continuing on with the same actions and attitudes. Nebuchadnezzar did what we all have to do to break off the Babylon mentality, to repent and change our ways. Remember, God doesn't want lip service. He doesn't want empty words from us. He wants our wholehearted worship. He wants us to truly live what we say we believe because that's where he forgives us. That's where he saves us. That's where he changes us. And from there, we can change the world for him. And none of us is outside of his reach. No one is too far gone. Hear me say that. No one is too far gone. And that's what the book of Daniel is telling us here, that when he laid down his pride and surrendered to God, even the king of Babylon could be restored. And that's why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves and call out to God, our sanity is restored. And we are restored. Our God is so faithful. So how do we break the Babylon mentality? How do we stop elevating self and lowering God? Well, just like it happened with Nebuchadnezzar, our restoration happens when I will exalt God because he's always worthy. 
Romans 8, 36 says, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. Restoration happens when I will trust God because he's always right. I love this. In Psalm 119, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Restoration happens when I will humble myself because it's not about me. Nebuchadnezzar had to learn this, and so do we. We can't be led astray by illusions of power and achievement and security, by the idol that we so often make out of our own names. The Bible says, he must become greater. I must become less. So take his name, lift up his name. Do you wanna keep from losing your identity or maybe to get your identity back? Do you wanna stand firm against the Babylon mentality in your life and be effective in God's kingdom? Here are three questions to ask yourself. How do I see the Babylon mentality at work in the culture around me? Do I see the Babylon mentality at work in my own life? Whose name am I exalting, taking, lifting up? And what step can I take to lower myself and exalt God? Babylon's motto says, I am and there is no one besides me. We've all been there. And if we're honest, some of us are there right now but we don't have to stay there. Thanks to Jesus, we can be set free. We can be restored. So humble yourself, trust God, and live to exalt His name. Let your identity be in who you are and in being called His own. Let your identity be in who you are because of Him and in being called His own. Would you pray with me? God, thank you that you are high and exalted. You are so worthy of everything, of all of our praise. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to daily humble ourselves and exalt you for who you are, that we would live for your glory, that we would live fully in to being who you've made us to be and that we would live like we believe that we belong to you and that no one else gets to tell us who we are. And I wanna pray two other prayers, prayers of surrender today. I wanna pray for anyone who realizes that you've been taking his name in vain, calling ourselves Christians, but living something different. You can recommit your life to Jesus right now. And I wanna pray for anyone who's realizing for the first time, maybe today, that you've been living in exile, in separation from God, and that you need to repent of your own ways and choose His way. Would you pray this prayer with me? In your heart, you can be set free when you pray, Jesus, I trust you that your name is the one that's worthy. So I lay down my life right now to exalt you. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins, to forgive me. I take your name, Jesus and I will lift up your name with all my life. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we give a hand to anyone who prayed those prayers for the first time today, or for anyone who decided to recommit their lives to Jesus, to take his...